Hello, good crowd. I am so excited. We have with us today Catherine Hayhoe, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. She is an atmospheric scientist at uh, Texas Tech University. She hosts the PBS show uh, Global Weirding, and she is has been listed on Times 100 Most Influential People and Fortune 50s, Fortune's 50 Most uh, greatest leaders. I mean, holy cow, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have with us today, Dr. Catherine Hayhill. So stick around. You don't want to miss this episode. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, we are thrilled, 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 thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I know you're really, really busy, and we're just really thrilled to have you. Um, you know, the, the climate crisis has a lot of us a little anxious, a little confused, a little worried, um, and I think with good reason. But let's, let's take a, a start where you are, uh, tell us a little bit about global weirding. What do you mean by global weirding? Sure. Well, often people say, don't you mean global warming? Um, and that's what we think about typically, but we don't feel, we don't experience global warming. I mean, we can't tell that the earth is warming by one or two or three or even five degrees. But what we can see is that things are just getting weirder. So it's hot when it shouldn't be. Hurricanes have more rain than they should have. We're seeing three 500 year flood events in three years. That's not normal. We're just seeing things get weird. That's how we ourselves are experiencing the impacts of a changing climate in the places where we live. So when we were looking for a title for our YouTube series with PBS, we thought, why not call it Global Weirding? Perfect, perfect. Now, um, why is two degrees such a big deal? Uh, you did an episode recently and you explained this. Take a minute and tell us, why such a little difference matters so much to the climate? Well, when we say the planet's warming by one or two or three degrees Celsius, often we think, well, that's nothing. There's a bigger difference between the room I'm in right now and just outside in the hallway, right? But what we have to understand is that the planet's temperature is as stable as that of the human body. And if our body's temperature goes up one and a half, two, three, or even four degrees Fahrenheit, we are running a fever. We go to the doctor. If it's three or four degrees, we go to the hospital. And that's what's happening to our planet. It is running a fever. And that fever is affecting us. It's affecting the way that we plan for our water and our energy and our food. It's affecting the quality of our air. It's affecting the safety of our homes. We care about a changing climate because it is affecting us. Two degrees is not a magic threshold. You know, if we're at 1.9 degrees, it doesn't mean everything's fine. And, you know, 2.1 degrees, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But as humans, we need a threshold to plan for. So we know that the more carbon we produce, the worse it is. Just like we know the more cigarettes we smoke, the worse our health risks are. There's no magic number of cigarettes that can prevent all damage other than zero. It's too late for that. But we do know that the quicker and the faster we stop smoking, the better off we'll be. It's the same way with climate change. And so all the governments in the world got together and some of them said, well, we're already at one degrees and it's dangerous for us. And then some of them said, well, you know, we've crunched the numbers and we think three degrees will be okay for us, but beyond that is dangerous. And everybody had to negotiate to figure out, well, what do we agree on? And they agreed finally on two degrees or one and a half if we can. It, uh, it, one of the interesting phenomena that you and I both see uh, that is almost unique to the United States is that there are a lot of people who deny climate science. And there is a correlation. It's not perfect and it's not necessarily causal, but there's a correlation between those who deny climate science and uh, faithful, religious, Christian people in the United States. Um, you and I are both people of faith. How do you respond to people of faith who tell you that climate science is bunk? Well, our most popular global weirding episode, the one that the most people have watched, is called What Does the Bible Say About Climate Change? 
And that's sort of a trick question because of course it says nothing about climate change, but it says a lot about our responsibility for this planet, about God's love and care for creation, and about how we are to care for our brothers and sisters, especially those who are less fortunate than us today. So I've looked into this and thankfully, as you just said, the correlation is not causal. So believing the Bible doesn't make us reject the idea that climate is changing due to human activities. In fact, as I recently said in a New York Times op-ed just the other week, if we truly take the Bible seriously, we would be out at the front of the line demanding action on climate change because that's what we as Christians would do because of who we are. So why is it that we reject the reality of what the science has been telling us since the 1850s? That's how long, not 1950s, 1850s. It's because we've confused our politics with our religion. The causal link is where we fall on the political spectrum. The further we fall to the right-hand side of the spectrum, the more likely we are to reject the science. But does that mean we aren't smart or we don't know science? No, not at all. There's tons of smart people all across the political spectrum. What it means though, is we've decided we don't like what we've been told are the solutions. We have been told the solutions are big government, socialism, communism, destroying the economy, taking away my truck, letting China or the United Nations or the Antichrist rule the world. And frankly, I don't like those solutions either. <laughs> but instead of looking for positive solutions that are consistent with our values, often what we do is we just say, oh, well, if there's no solution that I can be on board with, then it can't be a real problem because I'm a good person and if it were a real problem, I would wanna fix it. But if I don't wanna fix it, it can't be a real problem. So we throw up science-y sounding smoke screens like it's just a natural cycle or religious-y sounding smoke screens like God is in control to hide our real problem, which has everything to do with our aversion to what we think are the solutions. So let's talk about some of the solutions. Uh, and, and when we think about big business, and big business plays a big role because big business does a lot of stuff. What is the role of big business in a climate solution? Huge. Um, because business is a big part of both the production of heat trapping gases. When we dig up and burn coal and gas and oil, it's wrapping an extra blanket around the planet that it didn't need. And just like we would if somebody snuck into our room at night and put an extra blanket on us that we didn't need, in the same way the planet is heating up because of that blanket. So business has a huge role to play in solutions. And the really cool thing is that they are playing a huge role. So if you look at the world's richest corporations, you've got Walmart right there at the top, right? And Walmart is planning to be 50% clean energy by 2025. Isn't that amazing? And then Berkshire Hathaway, I think, is somewhere around 11 or so on the list. Their most recent headline was they're putting up a huge wind farm in Alberta, which is the Texas of Canada, known for oil and gas. Apple is around number 12. They're already 100% clean energy, and they're decarbonizing their supply chain in China. And India, I believe, has more green energy jobs than any other country in the world. Here in the U.S., we have more solar jobs than coal jobs already. And the Museum of Coal Mining in Kentucky put solar panels on the roof. So there's a lot to do with industry. We are at a key point in, in the transition of our society where, you know, 120 years ago, we were transitioning from horses and buggies to cars. Now we're transitioning from the coal and oil and gas we've used for 300 years to new sources of energy. And there are plenty of opportunities for businesses as well as challenges in that move. Well, you know, the opportunities uh, are the sorts of things that, that entrepreneurs smell. Tell us about the opportunities for entrepreneurs in this shift. Oh, well, that's really interesting to me personally. So I'm a scientist, first of all. I do a great job at diagnosing the problem and telling us just how bad it's going to be if we don't change our ways, you know, sort of like one of those Old Testament prophets. And then when people change their ways, we're like, oh, they changed their ways. How surprising. <laughs> but... I find that very encouraging. So I love hearing about entrepreneurs who are figuring out brand new ways to do things that are smarter and better. Some of my favorite entrepreneurs are kids and young people. There was a girl who started growing algae under her bed. Her mother eventually kicked her out into the garage. She figured out how to turn her algae into biofuel and she won the National Intel Science Fair. In, um, California in LA, United Airlines is flying their flights out of the LAX airport off biofuel. 
Uh, I went to visit a company in Iowa recently, REG, Renewable Energy Group. They literally collect used cooking oil from like McDonald's and KFC, used cooking oil that they wouldn't know how to dispose of anyways, or it'd be a problem for them. They collect it, they turn it into biofuel that powers trucks. You don't have to change the truck. All you're doing is putting something different into the tank. And then there's things like solar paint. There's military applications that save lives. There's innovations for increasing our air quality. There's, you know, just the simple fact that you can plug your car into the wall of your house now and charge it with your solar panels. I mean, there are so many really cool, amazing things. And you can tell I get kind of excited when I think yes. about these solutions. As we think about the, an end-to-end -end solution for climate change, it seems like even individuals will need to make changes. And you talked about the fact that some people don't like what they're being told they have to do, but sometimes what they're being told they have to do is uh, a political message, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it isn't the reality of what they really could and should be doing to save the planet. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what would you tell someone who is who wants to do their part to solve climate change what's their personal responsibility what are the best things they can do well i would say first of all we're not saving the planet we're saving us the planet will still be orbiting the sun long after we are gone we care about ourselves our families our kids our communities our city our state our country we care about ourselves and that's what's at stake here so one of the most important things we can do, and I actually talk about this in my TED talk, is talk about it. Because it turns out we never have conversations about this because we're worried, well, I'm not a scientist or I don't wanna pick a fight with Uncle Joe or my mom. But talking about it is the most effective thing that we can do. And if we do talk about it, turns out it can change people's minds about the impacts and about the solutions. Because I'm not talking about talking about the science, I'm talking about how does it affect us in the place where we live and what can we do? So talking about it is the most important thing we can do and everybody can do that. And then we can step on the carbon scales and we can say, well, where does my personal carbon footprint come from? And a lot of us will be surprised that it might not be where we think it is. So for a lot of us, it's our food and it's not just what we eat, it's what we don't eat. We throw out about a third of the food we produce. And if food waste were its own country, it would be number three in the world after China and the US. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, so eating lower down the food chain, you don't have to eat as much beef, have a meatless day, and don't waste your food is something really important. And then flying is a big part of my personal carbon footprint. So I do a lot of these virtual type talks. We're not wasting any carbon here. We're doing it virtually. Um, and then when I do travel, I do so carefully. I think about how many things can I do in one place that, that make that plane trip worthwhile. Um, I love my plug-in car, um, but for a long time, we couldn't afford solar panels. They were just too expensive. Thankfully, thanks to the tax rebate, we actually finally got them this year, and I'm super excited about that. I hang up my laundry to dry. We have this place where you can put in an extra freezer. So instead of putting in an extra freezer, I just got racks, which were cheaper than an extra freezer, and I hang up my clothes. I replace my light bulbs. But talking about it is the most important thing we can do to our friends and our family and to our elected officials. Because it doesn't matter who we are, climate change affects us all. And so I was really happy to participate in a project called New Climate Voices. And people can find it online at newclimatevoices.org with a Republican politician, with the leader of a libertarian think tank, and with a military general who all talked about solutions that are consistent with their values and their perspective. And I love that. No, that's great. That's great. Catherine, you've been at this for a while. You've developed quite a reputation. What are you most proud of having accomplished? Wow. Um, honestly, I think I'm proudest of when just one person says, I never thought much about this before, or even I thought it was a load of crap, but you changed my mind. This actually matters. That's what means the most to me because I feel like, hey, I had a conversation and it actually worked. What's the most important lesson you would want us to take from our conversation today? I think the most important lesson is that what we have in common is far more than what divides us. Our society right now is just fracturing and dividing along what people call tribal lines. I don't like you because you go to a slightly different church than I do. I definitely don't like you. In fact, I'm not even sure you're human because you didn't vote for the right party in the last election. 
We are just focusing on what divides us. And unfortunately, climate change is the great uniter. It affects every single one of us, no matter who we are and where we live. And it disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable people, the very people that we know that we as Christians are told to care for. So focus on what unites us rather than divides us. Focus on how climate change affects us in the places where we live, where we share common values and concerns. Look for solutions that are good for us that grow the economy, that create jobs, that put money in our pockets, because those solutions really do exist and we can all agree on those. What got you interested in studying climate change and atmosphere? Well, I was actually studying astrophysics. That was my plan. Um, because what's more fascinating than being able to figure out what's happening on the other side of the universe, just using your brain sitting here on this little planet. But when I was almost finished my degree, just before heading to graduate school, I took a course on climate change and it completely changed my perspective because up until then, I thought that climate change was just another one of those environmental issues that environmentalists care about. And I'm not an environmentalist myself, but I wish them well. I would like them to fix those things. And if I could certainly help, I'd be willing to help, but I didn't feel like it was my thing. When I took that class, I was completely shocked to learn, first of all, that climate science was all physics, the very same physics I was learning in astrophysics. I don't know what I thought it was, but I didn't think it was that. And then the second thing that completely shocked me was, again, the fact that I learned that climate change is a threat multiplier. We don't care about it just because we're an environmentalist or just because we're a scientist. If we care about our health, if we care about our family, if we care about the economy, jobs, national security, even more importantly for me personally, if we care about other people, if we care about poverty and hunger and disease and lack of access to clean water and political instability and refugee crises, if we care about all of these things, we already care about climate change, we just haven't connected the dots. So I thought to myself, here I am, I serendipitously have the exact skill set you need to work on this issue. How can I not when it's people's lives that are at stake? Fantastic. Catherine, what is your superpower? Um, probably really good quality fish oil, <laughs> but, but I would say, um, I would say the only superpower really is being human and remembering that I'm human. So often, again, we're so quick to draw the lines between people and say, well, I don't like you because, but if we can focus again on what we have in common, what unites us, what values we share, and that's something that I can't always do necessarily, but if we can do that, that is all of our superpowers. Excellent. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Before you go, tell us how people can learn more about your work and how they can connect with you on social media. That would be fantastic. So my website is just my name, katherinehayhoe.com, and you can find my TED Talk there, as well as a lot of other interviews and essays that I've done, including I will make sure this one is posted too. Our global weirding series is on YouTube, and it answers all kinds of common questions like, how do we know it isn't a natural cycle? Is this thing too late to fix? Um, what about fossil fuels they brought us so far? And I'm just one person, what can I do? And I'm also on social media, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on LinkedIn, and you can find me all four of those places. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, again, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, and we wish you every success in, uh, well, you know, solving the climate crisis for us. Thank you. Let's do it together. All righty. Let's do some good. Devon Thorpe's mission is to end extreme poverty, improve global health, and mitigate climate change before 2045 by finding and sharing the stories of those who are doing the most good. Thanks for tuning in to the Your Mark on the World show, the Social Impact Podcast. Please subscribe via YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. Spotify.